Time to tantalize your earbuds with creative makers and shakers. It's Creative Living, the podcast with Jane Klaus. <laughs> this is Creative Living, the podcast, and I am Jane. And I love doing this podcast because I get to talk to like-minded people who are telling a great story through their craft. They're creating something all the time, and they also love to inspire others to create. Now, it's no secret that this handmade movement is soaring these days, and it all came to the forefront during the pandemic because, I mean, quite frankly, people found their sewing machines and they found their bread pans. I mean, heck, they even discovered their kitchens. Uh, they also found some other supplies that could kickstart their home-based hobby. And today, this home-based hobby is fueling side hustles all over the country. Now, as we all know, there are so many ways to be creative these days. Some of you stick to one craft, that's your passion, while others try whatever is trendy and cool. And if you're like my guest today, you can do it all. Currently, he's breaking the social media world with his TikTok videos by taking quilting to a whole new level. I am super excited to have Chris Marchini with me today on the show. Hey, Chris. Hello. Thanks for having me today. I'm so excited to talk to you because you are doing so many cool things. When did you start quilting? Uh, I started quilting primarily uh, about three and a half years ago um, after we moved into our house and I had a, a, a proper studio space. Have you always been a sewist? Have you always been creative? Yes, absolutely. So I started sewing probably when I was around eight. My mom taught me. I was not allowed to use her sewing machine, though. So it was a lot of hand sewing, <laughs> making clothes for my stuffed animals and such. Um, and then, you know, as I finally was old enough and got my own sewing machine, learned that. So I've I've been sewing on and off for, you know, 30 plus ish years. <laughs> So I'm definitely a sewist at heart. But you've always been creative. So you've mm -hmm. uh, do you've done other things, right? You've tried your hand. Like I was saying, some people do one thing and they stick with it because they love it. Other people do what's trending and cool. You've done some paper crafting. Oh yes, done, I yeah. collected many hobbies over the years. I've done <laughs> scrapbooking, paper crafting, card making, uh, vinyl signs, painting clay sculpture like uh, if it's out there and it seems interesting i have either tried it or it's on my to-do list to try so what is it about a hobby or a craft that you change your mind and you move on to the next thing so when i i start a hobby i i do a lot of um i say research but like watching youtube videos something that sparks my interest i will collect all the tools supplies and eventually, when I feel that I've somewhat mastered the craft, I start to get a little bored with it. So then I'll move on to the next one. What has, you know, caught my eye and, you know, go from there, collect another one. So I ended up with a lot of just random stuff in my craft room. I, I think a lot of creative folks can sympathize with that and kind of relate. Um, you know, a lot of these hobbies are are somewhat expensive to get started with, to get all of the supplies. And you don't want to just, like throw them out so your craft room gets full of all sorts of things from all sorts of different medias yeah and you're like i'm gonna go back to that i'm saving right. <laughs> jars like it's my job like every time i empty a can of pickles or a jar of pickles or a jar of jelly I'm like i'm gonna save this because i'm gonna make something out of it and yeah. then i have a whole bunch of jars am i going back to that <laughs> probably not what is it about sewing that you love so much i really like being able to join you know, two pieces or more of fabric, you know, stitching them together and then they are joined. They are now a single piece. They'll be together for, you know, probably forever. And I always say, once you've stitched two pieces of fabric together, they they match. They're now a single unit. Like it just creates something new. And I love it. I love it too. And I love you because you are a sewist and I love sewing. And so I really connect... I connect with creative people and connect with makers because we all have that. But the sewing part of it to me, being able to put two pieces of fabric together and construct it, it's not coming apart, really. Right. You don't have to intentionally take it apart. It's not just going to detach someday. 
you know, quilting and just sewing in general, it's a much longer shelf life. Like a lot of these things I've created will outlive me. You know, there's quilts in museums that are a hundred years old. Yes, they look a hundred years old, but they're still intact. You can still enjoy them. And they've been through so much. I probably can't even count how many times they've been laundered before they ended up in a museum or on display somewhere. And they're just kicking it. They're they're still here. They're kicking it. I, you're right. I mean, those quilts, they tell a story. Not only do they tell the story about the person that made it and what was happening when they made it or why they made it, but it's about the people who used it mm -hmm. and where was it laundered and how did it get to this point and to, into your hands? Like the, the story of a quilt, it, just for me to imagine what that is, is it's satisfying. You know, I'm not a quilter. I wish I was. I can't. I don't know. We're going to get into why I can't be a quilter, Chris, but I do love sewing. Now, you're not a traditional quilter in the sense of your design aesthetic. Right. So what makes you so unique in the quilting world? So I very much enjoy scrappy quilts, you know, a lot of just different prints, things that you may not necessarily think go together. But I also want my quilts to somewhat tell a story or invoke an emotion. So I have different images really in the center of most of my quilt patterns. Um, things from like a skull wearing a crown, a poison apple, a giant monstera leaf. Um, and they're not traditional block based designs. Um, a lot of traditional quilts, you'll see it's the same block repeated over and over. Like you have the same block four times across, five times down, that's your quilt. And it might create some secondary patterns, um, but it's just the same thing, which is lovely. It's great. Um, it's just not my aesthetic. So my quilts probably look a lot more complicated than they are. <laughs> Different shapes of squares and rectangles and triangles. Um, but when you put it all together, you end up with an image in the middle. It's like those, um, I think they're called tanagrams that you played with in grade school to yeah. learn geometry and you would, you know, create different shapes. And that's kind of, I, I loved those as a kid. So that's kind of my aesthetic, um, creating those images with just this limited number of shapes. I always wonder how, cause I, the traditional quilting is like, you make a block, you make the same block, the same block and you put them all together. But looking at your quilts with the skulls and the crowns, I mean, it's that massive image in the middle, which, to me is just super cool. Like you're, you're taking this idea of a traditional quilt and, and you're like a disruptor mm, in yes. the community, but a good That's disruptor because you're giving it and, and you're, you're, you're an influencer to others who may want to try quilting. They don't have to have their grandma's quilt. So can you, you know, when you think about your quilting, your, your style is sort of funky. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, I've been posting a lot of videos on, TikTok, and I've seemed to have attracted a, a younger crowd who's interested in maybe quilting. I've had comments of, you know, I've always wanted to get into quilting, but nothing's really been my style, and this is my style. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping to continue that, to continue to inspire the younger generation to get into the art, because I don't want the art to to die eventually if no one's interested and no one's doing it it'll just you know be oh yeah i remember when they used to do that and that's i don't i don't want that i really enjoy it i like the the craft it's fun and you end up with something functional when you're done so that's the yeah. one thing i love most about creating and making especially for me on the sewing side so i'll take an old garment and turn it into something new or even just taking fabric and putting it together at the end of the day, it's that sense of satisfaction that you made it yourself. And then everybody else that sees it, in your case, the quilts, they're like, wow, this is great. Where'd you buy it? Because you just don't see a quilt with a skull on it. Where'd you right. buy it? You're like, I made it. And you're and people are just so impressed the fact that you made it. So part of, I think, inspiring other people to create is explaining what that sense of satisfaction feels like. And because you're really out there with a big fan base sort of preaching like, hey, this is easy. It's fun. You have something tangible in your hand when you're done. So when you talk to your fans, who are you talking to? 
anyone really a lot of folks you know they're like oh you know i can't get into quilting it's it's too difficult it's too complicated and i primarily um design and release patterns with instructions on how to make the quilt yourself and i've really broken it down to where i hope you know if you have a basic fundamental knowledge of how to use a sewing machine and so you can do this you know step by step here's how you create this you know triangle here's how you attach all these pieces together and have it broken down into more manageable chunks i really want to to really get out there that this isn't as difficult as it may look at the surface you know when you break it down take it step by step i mean really anyone could do this if you have access to a sewing machine and can sew a, a straight ish line you can make it work Okay. So now you've opened up the can of worms. I've been <laughs> sewing since I was seven. I'm not the best sewer ever, but I can definitely sew a straight stitch. I sort of shy away from quilting for some reason, because I think it's challenging. It's complicated. There's way too much math. And it reminds me of a word problem. How do I get over that hump? Just dive into it <laughs> and don't worry about making mistakes. So if you get, you know, get into the quilting world, you'll hear a lot of terms about or stories about the quilt police. <laughs> there are people out there that say you have to use fabric from, you know, a fabric quilt store. You can't like go to your local big box store and just buy whatever off the shelf. It's not good enough. You have to use certain thread. You have to do all these techniques. If you ever want to start an argument amongst quilters, just ask them what kind of thread they use it, it, it's entertaining to watch at times but other times i just roll my eyes um you know there's debate on whether you should press your seams open or to one side the dark side or the light side like there's all of these you know quote unquote rules that people think are out there you don't really need them it's fine you know your first quilt i promise you is not going to be perfect and that is more than okay just make it, put it together. If it's not perfectly square, if it doesn't lay flat, it's fine. Just finish it and learn from it. And then you can go on to your second quilt. And the most important part is to enjoy the process. Enjoy the actual act of making it. And that is where I find joy. I really enjoy making it, seeing it come together. You know, I still make mistakes and I've been sewing for 30 years and I started um a couple of years ago I started tracking how many quilts I make last year in 2021 I actually completed 21 quilts wow and I think I'm up to 40 total since I started tracking in 2019 I want to say or wow. maybe 2020 um you know, so I've made quite a few quilts and I still make mistakes. Sometimes my points don't match up perfectly, but it's okay. You know, I think I, it gives a character, right? It does. Absolutely. It shows that this was made by a person and not by a machine. Mm -hmm. So embrace the little flaws. It, um, yeah, I'm, it feels like so much pressure, you know, the quilt police, as you call them, because mm -hmm. I know those people. I know exactly <laughs> who they are. Because I, I run into them sometimes and they're like, when I'm talking about a shirt or, you know, I'm not very precise in how I do it. And a lot of people aren't. And and I always say, just start, just try it when I'm saying, you know, upcycle clothing. And you're saying the same thing about quilting, but it does feel like a lot of pressure. Like I need to get it right. What do you say to somebody because you made that mistake and you get discouraged and then it ends up in the pile? You know mm -hmm. the pile. Yes. Finished <laughs> is better than perfect. You know, I, I'm not the first one to say that. There's lots of, especially in the quilting world, you'll watch videos on YouTube and you'll hear that a lot. And it's very true. Just finish it. Even, like I said, if it doesn't lay flat, if it's not square, it's fine. It's still going to be functional. If you can lay underneath it, it's a quilt. You're good to go. Um, one thing I learned is it all comes out in the wash. Literally. It, literally, it does. So <laughs> if your lines are a little wobbly, your points aren't matching up, after you've given your quilt its initial wash, that's when all of the cotton fibers shrink. So like the batting in between the layers shrinks a little bit. The backing shrinks a little bit. All your squares shrink a little bit. And it gets this lovely crinkly texture that distracts from every mistake you've made. It's wonderful. 
And so as people are stressing out like, oh, you know, I really don't like how this one little intersection looks or maybe my stitching was a little wobbly here. Just wait until it's washed. You won't even be able to find that when you pull it out of the dryer and lay it down on your bed. That is the best top tip I've ever heard about quilting because, oh yeah, we know when you're driving the long arm and you're doing that top stitching business, like it, it sometimes it crosses over yep. and sometimes things aren't right. But when you put it in the watch, I always say when you iron it, when you press those stitches, it kind of smooths everything out and you can't really see those mistakes. But in this case, we're throwing it, we're giving it a wash. You know, it gets that crinkly texture and everything just disappears. You know, you'll still see your blocks or your image or, you know, whatever quilt design you've made. But a lot of that, like a wobble in your stitch on your top stitching, it just disappears. It's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> Doing the repeating squares over and over again, that's a pattern that you're using. Your work has these cool images in the center of them. Mm hmm is it tricky to follow the instructions? Because now you're making these patterns that, for people to follow. So if you're not a pattern person, some people are, some people are not. It, if you're not, are they hard to follow? I don't think so. And I've gotten a lot of feedback that they are very easy to follow. So a lot of quilt patterns when you buy them might be four to six pages long. A lot of written instruction, you know, cut out this size, sew these two pieces together, et cetera. In my quilts, there, there's quite a bit of written instruction, but then when you get to the assembly part, it's all visual. I have graphs and diagrams showing you, you know, for this section, it's these pieces, here's how you assemble them. And it's typically like three or four steps per section so that you can join them, join the next one to it, so you don't end up with any partial seams or Y seams to get everything to join together. It's just a straight seam. Then you put these two chunks together and then add on this chunk and you just slowly build it up to your section. And most of my quilts are between, well, they usually hover around 20 sections. So I break them up into manageable pieces. Then you join all the sections together and you have your quilt top. In theory, when we're reading the instructions, you're putting it together. Is there like an average amount of time or it's quilting like a thing. You need some patience and you need to just let it simmer as you're going through it and enjoy the process. You definitely need patience. And you also need to know that it's okay to walk away. There are times that I'll get frustrated. I'm like, I just need to take a break. I just need to walk away before I, you know, get too irritated with this. Because I'll make a mistake, rip it out, and then go to sew it again. And nine times out of 10, I end up making the same mistake again. I'm like, okay, it's time for a break. I got to walk away. Um, so this isn't something you're going to throw together in a night. It's going to take a couple weeks. You know, if you're just sewing for an hour after work, or even if it's just 15 minutes, you just wanted to, you know, throw these little pieces together to get started. That's fine. Just a little bit here and there. You'll get it done eventually. Talk about using reclaimed materials and recycled fabrics is that something that you incorporate into some of your work? Is that something that you would cheer on other people to do? Absolutely. So I love reclaimed fabric. Um, on TikTok, actually, I've seen a lot of uh, fabric resale stores popping up that are like vintage fabrics or donated fabrics. You know, maybe someone's mother passed and they had this huge sewing room and, you know, none of the kids so they don't have any use for it. So they'll find these fabric reuse stores and donate them. And they, in turn, you know, curate them and sell them. And most of them I've seen like at $4 a yard, which if you're into quilting, you know, that is like dirt cheap. <laughs> um, so I highly encourage checking those out. You know, I'll go thrifting and check out the, the linens section. A lot of sheets are, you know, 100% cotton. Yeah. That's what we use for quilting. So I'll pick those up. They're great for quilt backs because you don't have to piece them together. It's already the size of a yes. bed. Throw it on and go. Another top tip. Yes. Um, I have made a couple memory quilts out of like button up shirts. Um, so that's some reclaimed fabric. But yeah. I, you know, use what you have. You don't have to invest in all of this, you know, $14 a yard fancy quilt fabric to get started. Pick up those sheets, pillowcases, you know, check out the, the clothing section. If it's 100% um, cotton, just woven fabric, 
it'll fit in just fine. And you cut it up and there you go. Why can't you just use like an old prom dress or use like other, like a blouse? Does it have to be cotton or can you use these sort of different material makeups? You definitely can. Uh, Different materials can be a little trickier to combine. Just, you know, if it's like a satin, so it's like super slick, that can be a little frustrating to sew with at times. Um, But if you're using reclaimed material, if you pre-wash, you know, wash everything and make sure it has pre-shrunk, then it will fit together fine. A lot of memory quilts, you'll notice there's, you know, maybe some denim and some, you know, shirt weight cotton and maybe even some knits from t-shirts. You know, you it is absolutely possible to mix them together. Just a little prep work will save you a lot of headache. So if it's stretchy, put on a like an iron-on interfacing to keep it from stretching too much. Um, get everything pre-shrunk so that once you wash it, maybe something doesn't shrink more than the other. But yeah, I, I highly encourage mixing it. You know, if you're feeling ambitious, go for it. Absolutely. There are no rules. So mm-hmm. do what makes you happy. When we're using a hundred percent quilting fabric, or if we have fat quarters that we're working with, should we pre-wash those? Personally, I do not pre-wash. Oh. I don't because that's extra time. <laughs> that I just don't want to do. Like you'd have to wash it and then iron it, like to get it prepped. Um, you know, back in the day, it was important because a lot of dyes didn't have good fixatives, so they would bleed. So if you had like a a red and white quilt, you'd probably end up with just an overall pink quilt after you <laughs> washed it. That's not the case so much anymore with new technologies, like you know, high quality um, quilting cotton doesn't bleed at all, like regardless what color it is. Um, batik fabrics, which are very popular in the quilting world, do tend to bleed. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you are designing, like what kind of colors go together. If it's all different shades of the same color, I wouldn't worry about it. There are also these things called um, color catchers that you can throw in your washing machine along with your quilt that do this magic thing that as the colors bleed off the fabric, it like goes out and grabs it. So it doesn't get onto your other fabrics. They are a life saver, let me tell you. Another top tip, color catchers. Yeah. Chris, you are full of magical tips for us. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes colors do bleed. I've had a couple quilts where that happened. And it's now, it's just part of the story of the quilt. I love the story of the quilt. So you're not pre-washing all that cotton. That's so interesting. Because you said when you wash it, it shrinks a little bit. Does mm-hmm. that help then with the shape because you didn't pre-wash it? It it just helps with that um that crinkly texture. Yeah. Which some of those quilting police people out there don't like. <laughs> but I do. I love the the crinkly texture. It just makes it feel softer. It drapes better, you know, when you're snuggling under it. It just feels like, you know, a piece that was made with love. So some people want their quilts as showpieces. Some people want to use their quilt. Where do you fall in that? I absolutely want people to use my quilts. If I've gifted you a quilt in 20 years, I want to see it in shreds. I want to know that you have loved it. You have used it. You've spilled your coffee on it. Your kids have drunk it around the house. You know, just use it. That's that's why it was created. I had a quilt when I was very young. It was a, a crazy quilt. So it was just a bunch of different fabrics. Um, I, I don't know who made it, but I remember laying it out on my living room floor and I would kind of play that match game and you know match up two fabrics that looked the same and try and find them throughout the quilt. And I these are the memories I have of that quilt. That quilt is long gone. Uh, by the time I hit 20, like I remember it sitting in a laundry basket in literal shreds. Like it was <laughs> gone. But I loved that quilt so much. I dragged it around the house. I wanted to take it everywhere. And, you know, I have those memories. And I want people to have memories like that with my creations. I don't want it sitting in a closet, just collecting dust. And I think you are creating a whole new era of quilt lovers and quilt makers because of your influence on some of the younger generations to start quilting and, and also become disruptors in this quilting world. And we mean that in the, in the nicest possible way. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about social media because that is where your fan base is growing and thriving and booming. You are on Instagram and you mentioned TikTok. Is that where you're mostly at? 
TikTok is definitely taken off over the last probably two months. So I've been on Instagram with my quilting business since 2019, I believe. And I just hit a thousand followers. It's been very slow growing. I don't pay for ads and I don't really push a whole lot. Like, you know, like and follow and all that. Yeah. Um, but on March 1st, I posted a, a intro video on TikTok because March is National Quilting Month. Yes. So I, you know, set goals and I'm going to, you know, try to be more active and, and get this out there. And it blew up. Like, Wait, so you're saying March 1st of March 2022. 2022, correct. Um, I <laughs> downloaded TikTok at the beginning of the pandemic, like everyone did. Okay. You know, and I posted a few videos, like less than a dozen videos over two years. And they were okay. Um, but after I posted that intro video, like, I swear I got like 10,000 followers overnight. It felt like it was crazy. I went from 500 followers to 15,000 followers through the month of March. What? Like, it blew up. Why? Which is awesome. What I happened? love it. I don't really know. So the intro I mean, video. Aside I, from you being amazing and fun <laughs> and, and handsome and, and, and smart and intelligent, all the good stuff. But <laughs> you did one intro video and you blew up in three weeks. Yeah. So the intro video, I had um, the poison apple quilt that I was working on in the background. Like that was my, hi, I'm Chris. And this is what I do. And I don't know if it was because it was a poison apple or because it was you know, not your typical quilt, but people just started sharing it. And like, I got all kinds of comments and it, it was awesome. And I'm like, oh, this is really cool. Because people really do want to see these unusual quilts that are, you know, a, a different aesthetic and a different vibe than maybe your grandma's quilt was. So I just kind of ran with it. You know, I ended up, I released that pattern. I also released the pattern of the, the skull wearing a crown. Um, and it's gotten great responses. And honestly, when I was first designing them, I'm like, no one's going to want these. Like the quilt world doesn't like <laughs> skulls and spooky things. And that's just not what's out there. But, you know, TikTok has proved me wrong, which I'm okay with. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I got sucked into your TikTok videos too. And I don't have a TikTok account, or maybe I do. I'm actually not really sure. <laughs> I talk for a living and I refuse to do TikTok. It's super weird. I And I love to dance too. I could do a dancing video, but there's something that's holding me back from doing my craft on TikTok or doing putting anything on TikTok. How did you break through that? What would you say to other creative people to put their creative projects on the social media app? I would say just stick to your authentic self. Like just be yourself. Don't try to copy someone else that maybe you see as successful and like, I have to do it exactly like them. Just do your thing. Because I think that's what really attracts people to my channel is like, I'm just a goofball. I, you know, some of the videos I'm like, I don't want to post it. I look stupid. Like I look <laughs> like a dork out there just doing whatever I'm doing. And those are the ones that end up getting like the most responses. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's what people want to see. So I'm just going to be myself and put it out there. So, you know, I'm trying to help educate people on quilting. Um, so just it's TikTok. You have to have a super short video, which I'm used to more longer format, like maybe 10 minutes to, to teach a technique. Trimming that down to 60 seconds has taken some initiative <laughs> For sure, because I will just ramble. I record the videos, not in the TikTok app, but just on my camera. And I'll ramble on for minutes. And I end up cutting, you know, 90% of that out to get it down to 60 seconds. I'm going to ask you, because I know how hard it is to explain anything in 60 seconds. I'm not good at it at all. Do you, you're not just like winging it, like filming it and just hitting it. You're, you're really spending some time editing it and making it TikTok ready. Yeah, I do. I do that for sure. Because I ramble and I'll say the same thing over or I'll just totally, you know, fumble on my own words. I do that way more than TikTok would let on. <laughs> I also found that I say all right a lot. So I, I try to cut those out or you're going to just be here all right for 60 seconds. 
We all have a word. Mine is, I love this. I love this. I love that. <laughs> and I noticed I did that so the other day. I'm like, okay, enough of the, I love this. I got to stop that. So I'm glad that you have a crutch word too. All right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Now, how do you come up with your content? Because I mean, there's so many different parts of the quilting process. I saw you doing one showing us how to clip the seams and turn the corner, which I thought was fantastic. And it was really short and sweet. And you gave a little nugget. Uh, how do you come up with that content? Are you really just solely focused on quilters and quilting or are you trying to be irreverent and funny sometimes? Um, for the most part, I'm focusing on the the quilters and the quilting part of of it. You know, I've thought about, you know, posting like unrelated, just funny content, but I don't know. It just seems a little out of my out of my realm at the moment. I just kind of record what I'm doing that day and try to make a little video out of it. Yeah, and inspire others. And you're then reaping the rewards of lowering your stress by doing the making. Oh, yes, definitely. I I sew every day after work. Like that is my de-stress. That is my decompression from, you know, working in the corporate world. I get to then be creative, do my own thing. I don't have anyone, you know, giving me deadlines. Sometimes I give myself unrealistic deadlines, but I, I think all creative people tend to do that. Um, but yeah, it, it's just my, my happy place after work. Do you have a long arm in your house? I do. And it takes up a lot of space, but I love it. <laughs> it's an older machine. It's a company that's not around anymore. It's not super high end. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles and computer, um, guided stuff, but it gets the job done. And I have found that since I purchased it, I purchased it used in, I believe, 2020, in the summer of 2020, I found it online. Oh. Um, since purchasing it, I've been able to finish my quilts. So I don't have that problem that a lot of quilters do have, which is where they have all these tops created that are just sitting there. Because quilting stuff together can be very daunting. And it's a chore if you're just doing it on your domestic machine. You know, trying to wrestle a, even a queen size quilt through, oh, yeah. you know, it's yeah. physical. Yeah. I've done it and your arms get sore and it's frustrating. And so um, I convinced my husband to let me get a long arm. And, 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 and it's in, is it in your front room or is it? No, it's in my sewing room. Um, my sewing sewing room. You have a pretty big sewing room. It, it's not like the, the long arm takes up probably half of the sewing room. So it's a little cramped, but worth it. Uh, I've done many, many segments with so many quilters that have had these long arms and, and they would just take their dining room table out. Yep. This is where I'm putting my long arm. And uh, they, they put it in and then someone else had it in their family room, but it's fun to walk into a home where the long arm is at. And then other people that I know quilt, send them away to have it finished. Absolutely. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. There are Absolutely. people that all they do is long arm for other people. Like that's their, their business model is just to do that. You know, they want to help you finish those quilts. Are you a fabric hoarder? Because I've, I've seen this and I love it. You can get the fabric or you can get fat corners and you put it up on a wall and that just becomes your wall art. Oh yeah. I've seen that. I'm not a super big fabric hoarder. I have started to be, and I'm trying to kind of squish that. Um, I'm trying <laughs> to make luck. sure that I <laughs> use the fabric that's coming in and it doesn't just sit there because it's too precious to cut into, which happens. Um, but I have a, a shelf that all my fat quarters are stacked in and they're kind of like in rainbow order. So it is kind of pretty to look at. Um, I love this idea that the fabric is too precious to cut. One of my things is wh whatever city I'm going to, whatever country I'm going to, I find a fabric store. And even if I don't speak the language, I figure out how to order a yard of fabric. Usually I'm listening to the person order and I get, but then I have this beautiful fabric from wherever I was in the world and I don't want to cut into it. Yep. It happens a lot. A lot of people will, you know, have that, you know, they call it a unicorn fabric that they want to go after because it's one they've been searching for that they just fell in love with and then they get it and it just sits there. And the unfortunate thing is if you have it folded up sitting on a shelf, eventually you might get like a line, a permanent line where it's maybe faded or just permanently creased where you had it folded and it, you know, it doesn't ruin it. It's definitely still usable, but you have that blemish on it now that some people don't like um but you have it just sitting on the shelf so what was the point of getting it if it's not there you don't get to see it in use every day on something so i always encourage people just just cut it 
just do it. If it's something with a large print, just make sure whatever you're making has you know a large enough piece that you can get the essence of the fabric. Um, but you could even make clothing out of it. You can make a throw pillow out of it. Something where it's just going to now become part of your daily life. Yeah, and then you can look at it. You're right. It's just yeah. not doing anyone any justice sitting in the bin or sitting on the shelf, especially yeah. with that silly line. Okay, you're the just doer. You are a just Absolutely. doer. <laughs> Yes. I love that. You can preach all day long. Just do it. Just get started. Your company is called Rose City Originals. Yes. So I sell my patterns on Etsy, but I sell them primarily digital. I have started selling print copies for folks. Um, I believe I have six patterns currently released. I'm working on another one right now. Yeah. So I have my, my patterns out there. Um, I don't typically sell my finished quilts. Uh, making a quilt can be kind of pricey depending on the fabric plus all your man hours. So I kind of shifted to instead of trying to sell my quilts, selling the patterns. That way it can get out there to the masses. And I love seeing them posted on social media. I've seen some amazing color combinations that I never thought of. And they just look so cool. And so I love getting it out there in that respect, getting the pattern out there, having someone buy it and use it and make that quilt is just, I, I love it. And then they're getting the opportunity to get hands on, try mm -hmm. the craft, make something new. And, and, and also people don't really understand the man hours and how pricey quilts can be because of the time and the fabric and the prep, which is why we're going back to, I don't want to use it and shred it apart because yeah, <laughs> it took so much time and effort. It was pricey. Yeah. It, it's funny. If you talk to quilters about selling their quilts, you know, a quilter doesn't want to sell it for less than it's worth. So, you know, if this took me 40 hours and $300 in material, like it's easily going to go for like 12 to $1,500. And that's totally legitimate and valid. They don't want to sell it for 300 But that quilter is probably willing to donate that quilt or gift it to someone. No questions asked. It's a really funny, <laughs> funny mindset in the quilting world. Like, you know, yes, it cost me all this money and this time, but I'm going to gift it to you. So you know, if someone gifts you a handmade quilt, consider yourself very privileged, uh, but use it. Like they did not spend 40 hours of their life to sew these pieces together so it could sit on your shelf. The handmade anything to me, it's just so precious. It's such a great gift. I love yes. it. Now, Chris, what is your hope for the future of quilting? I really hope that more people just get into it, that they just take that first step and give it a try. And with the new, you know, younger generation coming in, we're going to hopefully see, you know, a lot more modern takes on a classic art. I love the idea of modern take on a classic art. That's so beautifully stated, Chris. I love it. Okay, Chris, how can everybody find you? How can they buy your patterns? How can they get in touch with you? So I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all as Rose City Originals. Um, also on Etsy under the same name. Chris, I am so happy that we are now best friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got him to laugh, people. I love it. <laughs> Chris Marchini, everybody. Be sure to follow him on TikTok and go visit him on Etsy. Buy some of those patterns. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on Creative Living. Thank you. Live better creatively. For more inspiration, visit janeklaus.com. Thank you for listening.